Hello my YouTube friends and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Jessica and I finished my PhD earlier this year and now I am working as a research scientist in environmental chemistry. It has been quite a few months now since I did a question and answer video so I thought today that I would answer some of your questions. I have been asking you over the last couple of months over on my Instagram at my PhD and me underscore to ask me some questions related to PhD life, related to being a researcher and just related to my personal life if you fancy and today I'm going to answer those questions. So let's dive in. So to start off there is a question about my work and the question asked how many hours do you work at your new job? I am contracted with my new job to work 37 hours a week which roughly works out to be about seven and a half hours every day. That doesn't include my lunch break, my lunch break is half an hour and it is unpaid so technically I am at work for eight hours but I'm only working for seven and a half of those hours. How I tend to do it is that I work seven and a half hours two days I work an hour extra on the other two days and then on a Friday it means that I can leave early which is fantastic. I've also started uh, starting my day at eight o'clock in the morning which means that on the days that I work seven and a half hours I leave at 4 p.m which is absolutely amazing and it makes such a difference because I'm home early and I feel like I still have a lot of my day left. The early finish on a Friday is fantastic also it means that I can get some errands done or I can just go and you know read a book or do whatever and yeah it really makes a difference having that early finish on a Friday. My work is also super flexible that I can start at whatever time I want as long as I get the work done and as long as I do my contracted hours then it doesn't matter when I do the work. That also includes working from home if I want to. Um, I do have the opportunity as long as I just let my line manager know I can work at home on my data and I don't strictly have to come into the office but because I do a lot of lab work I do tend to come in most days. So before I answer the next question, this little segment is going to be dedicated to today's video sponsor, which is Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive online learning platform where you can sign up for free and you can learn about maths, you can learn about software engineering, you can learn about everyday science and so much more. I really love Brilliant because I find interactive learning to be absolutely critical for remembering what you have learned. With Brilliant, you learn concepts and then you carry out a series of different interactive tasks, interactive games, where you're applying the concepts that you have just learned and it helps you to understand them so much better. There are a range of different courses to choose from and there are also lots of different courses within the courses, so the learning literally never stops. I have been diving into the science course and I have been really enjoying it because I've been going back to basics and I've been relearning things that I have forgotten about since my undergraduate days and it's actually really simple basic principles of everyday life and everyday science which you just forget if you aren't practicing and you're not you know keeping on top of your learning. I personally love to learn so having Brilliant as a tool for my spare time to kind of refresh my memory and to learn different things like maths which I really plan to dive into those maths courses it's just super useful because we need to keep exercising our brains guys and we need to keep learning because there is so much to learn out there. With today's sponsorship I bring you a discount code so although Brilliant is free to sign up and you can sign up today there is an alternative plan which I can get you 20 percent off of if you go to www.brilliant.org slash my PhD and me. I hope you get the chance to try out Brilliant and I hope you love it as much as I do and if you do decide to try it out please do comment below and I would love to know what you think. Okay back to the questions. The next question is what's the difference in job opportunities from BSc to MSc and PhD? This is an interesting question and I don't know if I 100% know the answer to this entirely but I do know that for a lot of quality control jobs, so for example I used to work as a quality control analyst in Malta and for that job you didn't even require a Bachelor of Science degree, like a college level degree, so like a HND was what it's called in the UK, was fine for that position. I know that a lot of other quality control jobs do actually require a BSc um, but a PhD is not required 
for that type of role. For some lab technician jobs, they do also require a BSc, but a higher qualification such as a master's or a PhD is not required for that. I feel like the main difference, again, this is just my opinion and do not quote me on this, I feel like the main difference between BSc slash MSc and then putting PhD into a different category is that for the majority of research roles require a PhD. Um, some research roles you can have a master's in research and they will take you, however the majority of them do require that you have the research experience which you gain by doing a PhD. For example, my current role required a PhD and I am a research scientist, that is my title. If you want to do a postdoctoral position, be a postdoctoral researcher, that of course requires a PhD. If you want to be a lecturer in science, most of the time, unless you have a lot, a lot, a lot of industry experience, then um, a PhD is also required to become a lecturer. So it just very much depends on the job. And like I say, I don't know about every single job related to science that's out there. I don't know about the requirements for all of them, but I do know that for most research related roles, the PhD is essential. Next question is, how did I go about applying for my PhD? Did it already a have a title? What was the story? So a lot of the time in the UK, and I think in some universities across Europe, the system works that you apply for a specific PhD project. So your supervisors would have written the grant proposal to get the money for that specific project. And you already know the outline of the project, the title of the project, and that's what you are applying for. I know that in the States, a lot of the time, the students actually have to come up with their own project. I think they have to do like a dissertation proposal. But for my specific PhD and for a lot of the PhDs in the UK and at some, in some universities across Europe, the project is already outlined. That doesn't mean that there isn't scope for changing bits of the project as it goes along. The general idea for the project is there, but it's usually quite flexible. So for example, I had the freedom and independence to actually change some parts of, of my project from what it was uh, stated in the original proposal. So I had that flexibility, but again, it depends on your supervisor and whether your supervisor wants to stick 100% to the proposal outline or whether they are quite happy to let you have that kind of creative freedom and come up with your own ideas. So yeah, there are two situations you can have a created project which is already outlined, which is my situation, and at some universities you're applying for a PhD program and then you have to create your own project. I applied for my specific PhD because during my master's year I had experience in a lab abroad doing natural products chemistry, which is what my PhD was in, so I got that research experience during my master's and I realised that I enjoyed that area of research and so I was looking for PhD positions in that research area. So when you're searching for a PhD, it's very important to narrow down where your research interests lie and if possible, try and get some experience doing that research area of research during your undergrad and then take it from there and that's where you should start looking for supervisors, supervisors that are in that area that you're interested in or looking for specific projects in that research area that you are passionate about. I was also asked, do I have any advice for living on a stipend? So a stipend is uh, your salary, your monthly salary that you get for doing your PhD. Of course, this is only available if you're doing a funded PhD because there's also self-funded PhDs, which mean that you have to pay for your fees and you also have to pay for your, you have to pay for yourself, basically. You don't get any money in return for doing your PhD. So my situation was a little bit different because I lived at home with my parents whilst I was doing my PhD, which of course meant that I saved a lot of money. I am very, very grateful to them for letting me um, stay at home whilst doing my PhD but of course I could only stay with them because my PhD is in my hometown so I didn't move away to do my PhD I actually moved back from Malta where I was working so for me the stipend was enough okay yes it wasn't great I couldn't go on you know big nice holidays or pay for a mortgage of a house, but it was enough for me because of my circumstance living at home with my parents. Again, it wasn't a lot of money, so I still had to be careful and I still had to budget. And I do very much enjoy making budget spreadsheets month to month where I put down all of my bills because I do still have bills even though living at home. And then I make categories of how much I want to spend on food, how much I want to spend on going out, how much I want to spend on, you know, clothes, for example 
I did have the luxury that I could spend my money on these things because I didn't have to pay for rent. And then I have Monzo, which is uh, a bank here in the UK. I think you can get it in other places too. And on Monzo, you can actually make these savings pots. I got this idea from my eyelash lady and she is an absolute gem. Shout out to you, Sammy. On Monzo, you can make these savings pots, which I didn't realise, and you can transfer money from the main account into these pots and you can basically budget for lots of different things and you can see how much money you have left to spend on these different areas. So that's how I have been budgeting. Um, it's Monzo. I'm not sponsored by Monzo or anything, but it's a very good app and it's a very good bank and I really love the savings pot feature of it. So it might be something to look into if you are on a stipend and you are struggling to save and you are struggling to budget month by month. I've personally found it super, super useful. Someone has asked a really interesting question related to writer's block. So they asked me, what tips do you have for when you encounter writer's block when you are writing your dissertation or your PhD thesis? So I did encounter maybe not so much writer's block, but lack of motivation and which turned into procrastination during writing my thesis, but it didn't get too extreme where I had days where I wasn't writing anything. One method that I found really useful for me was if I wasn't in the mood to write my results section for that chapter, for example, or I wanted a day to just kind of not think too much about writing, I would spend the day still being productive, whether that was making figures, whether that was um, formatting, whether that was just doing research for the introduction for another chapter, but not actually writing. You have to listen to your body and figure out how your body is feeling and what your brain wants to work on that day and take it from there. I honestly think that listening to your mind and your body is so important during writing your thesis because if you're not in the mindset for writing an introduction and you sit there and try to force yourself to write it, you're not going to get anything done. Use your time productively, figure out what kind of mood you're in and do tasks based on your mood. It's a good tip because you start off not feeling productive and by the end of the day you will have been productive but it might not have necessarily been in writing but you have ticked off other things for your list like formatting etc etc that you needed to do for the thesis at some point anyway. Moving on, someone has asked a personal question and they asked, do you plan to get married and to have children in the future? So if you haven't watched my previous video, I recently bought a house with my boyfriend, which I am so excited about. And yes, I do plan to get married at some point in the future. I don't know when that will be. At the moment, we are just focusing on the house. It's the most important thing and where we're putting our money into at the moment. And yes, at some point in the future, I would also like to have kids. Again, not any time in the near future because I just want to enjoy my life at the moment and be a little bit selfish I guess and I have just started my career so I want to have some time to really establish myself in my career before I make the jump and completely change my life with a, with children and yeah that huge life change so yes in the future I would like to get married and I would like to have children at some point too. Somebody asked, what are my three favourite subcategories of chemistry? So as you may know, my PhD was in natural products chemistry, which is the study of the compounds produced by living organisms. I specifically looked at marine invertebrates, but you can also study the compounds produced by plants, produced by fungi, produced by bacteria. So of course, my heart lies with natural products chemistry. In my new job, I am now working on environmental chemistry and also analytical chemistry. So I would say natural products chemistry, environmental chemistry and analytical chemistry are my three favourite subcategories of chemistry. So I wish I saw this question earlier, but someone asked, do you get paid during your PhD and what is the pay range? So I did mention a couple of questions back that you can get funded or self-funded uh, PhDs the funded PhDs you get paid every month. Just to put it into perspective, my pay started off, I think it was about £1,250 per month at the beginning of my PhD and this went up by £50 a month every year, which was quite random, I'm not really sure why that happened. And I think, depending on the country, the range can change, but I, I think my pay is quite standard for PhDs in the UK. Please correct me if I'm wrong because I don't 100% know. And I think the salary is about 15,000 a year if we're talking about it annually. So yeah, I think between 15 and 16 is quite normal for the UK. In other places it's more. Uh, I don't know if it's less in some countries, but yeah, that's how much I got paid. 
Another question I got is, is it easy to find a job after doing a PhD in Europe? I can only speak based on my situation for this, so just to put things into perspective, I applied for my current job at the end of last year, I did my interview and then I was offered the job and that was actually the first job that I had applied for and I got the job. So I don't really have much of a basis to go on because I didn't apply for a huge number of jobs and get rejected from a huge number of jobs. It, my situation was quite painless and quite free-flowing so I can't I don't have a big story to tell of how I applied for loads of jobs, applied for jobs that I wanted, did a load of interviews and got rejected. I applied for the first job, I applied for a job and then I got offered the job. So I'm sorry but I can't answer this question and I can't speak for the rest of Europe either because I don't know how many jobs are going in the rest of Europe. I was only applying within Scotland and yes, sorry I can't be more help on that one. Okay, to wrap up the video, we have the final question. The final question is, do you plan to become independent and have a chemical business or a venture? I love this question and got so excited when it was sent in because I have always thought to myself how cool it would be to have my own business and to be self-sufficient and to be managing my own business because I feel like your lifestyle can just change completely if you are a business owner. I love my job, don't get me wrong, and I love the flexibility of my job, which is just fantastic and you don't get that with every single job so I'm super grateful for that but yeah that extra added flexibility that you get when you're your own boss I think that would just be amazing. I'm not planning to quit my job anytime soon I'm just thinking you know way distant future that it would be something that would be really cool. What I would have a venture in I'm not too sure. I do have some ideas about businesses or a business that I would like to set up but that would be in the sidelines whilst I'm still working in my current job and it would be related to academia and PhD life and helping people but nothing has come of that yet. I am still, you know, something is brewing, something is coming so maybe stay tuned for the future and we'll see if I have done anything with these great ideas which are bubbling around inside my head. Okay so I'm going to wrap up the video there for today. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for sending in your questions. Also please do keep an eye out on my Instagram because sometimes I just occasionally pop up a question and answer box and ask you to ask me questions for videos like these. Thank you all again so much for watching and don't forget if you want to sign up for free for Brilliant the website where you can learn interactively, please visit www.brilliant.org slash my PhD and me and you will receive 20% off of your subscription. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye!